On behalf of the Center for Science and Environment, um, I welcome all of you to this initiative uh, on the occasion of the World Antimicrobial Awareness Week 2020. Uh, CSA is a non-for-profit public research and advocacy organization based out of New Delhi, India. Uh, I am Rajeshwari Sinha from the Food Safety and Toxins Program uh, here in CAC, where we've been working on the uh, issue of antimicrobial resistance or AMR, particularly the animal and environmental aspects of it. Uh, this conversation that we have today, uh, that we're going to do today, is a part of CSE's Act on AMR series, where we are engaging with experts uh, all over the world to know their thoughts on uh, how they would like to uh, address the issue of antimicrobial resistance, uh, what they have done, and particularly antibiotic resistance, which is a global public health threat. Uh, Today we are going to focus a little bit on uh, the animal aspects of the issue, uh, the antibiotic use and misuse in animals and uh, approaches or ways to reduce it. And to tell us more about all of this, we have uh, uh, two experts with us. Uh, one is Dr. Carl Peterson, and we also have Mr. Amit Khurana. I'll briefly introduce uh, both of them and then we move on to the conversation. Uh, Carl has worked with the National Veterinary Institute in, in Uppsala, Sweden uh, since 2018 as the head of section in the Department of Animal Health and Antimicrobial Strategies. Uh, the National Veterinary Institute in Sweden is a national reference laboratory for AMR in animals and is responsible for national level AMR surveillance in bacteria from animals and food. Uh, before coming to the National Veterinary Institute, uh, he has held a position as the professor in veterinary bacteriology at the National Veterinary Institute in the Technical University of Denmark. Uh, by training, Carl is a veterinarian uh, with a PhD in veterinary microbiology and a doctoral degree in veterinary science. His main interests lie in veterinary clinical bacteriology, uh, AMR, bacterial zoonosis, food safety, and infectious diseases in domestic animals, wildlife, and aquaculture. Uh, I'm also very pleased to introduce uh, my colleague, uh, Amit, uh, who is the director of the uh, Food Safety and Toxins Program here at CSE. Along with his team, Amit works and helps pushes for necessary changes in policies that help uh, contain antimicrobial reduce uh, resistance from uh, animal and environmental roots, and also regulate marketing of junk foods and chemical use in crops. Uh, thank you very much, Carl uh, and Amit, for joining us and you know agreeing to do this with us today. Um, it's, it's a really uh, good feeling that we managed to do this together and talk about uh, uh, the issue of antimicrobial use and misuse in animals. Uh, what, what we expect out of this is to understand how countries are addressing it. Uh, while Carl, uh, we wish to hear from you, your experiences from Sweden. Uh, Amit, we would, we would like to hear your experiences of working in India, engaging with stakeholders uh, beyond India uh, in the developing countries. Okay. Okay. So uh, very quickly, I'll, I'll get on with, with, the, with the discussion. And I'll begin with you, Carl. Uh, just for our viewers, uh, those who are uh, watching us and would like to understand the, the basics of the issue, can you tell us briefly about the problem of antibiotic uh, misuse and overuse in, in rearing animals for food? What is it all about and, and what linkages it has uh, for public health? Yes, I, I can do that. Uh, and first of all, thank you for inviting me uh, to this uh, uh, conversation. I'm very pleased to, to do that. Um, the, the problem is that, uh, or first of all, I should say that the, the, the main, uh, main driver for uh, development of antimicrobial resistance is the use uh, of uh, antibiotics. And uh, that is both in humans and in animals. So the more antibiotics you use, uh, the higher, the more selection for antimicrobial resistant bacteria will you simply have. So the, the more we use in, uh, in, in animals, the more antibiotic resistant bacteria will you get. 
That goes, for example, for zoonotic bacteria such as uh, Campylobacter and uh, MRSA or, uh, or Salmonella, which are directly transferred via the food chain from the animals uh, to humans. So antibiotic resistant Salmonella and Campylobacter will have a, a major impact of the, of the human health also. But also the, the use of, of antibiotics for animals will select antimicrobial resistance, not just in, in these bacteria that are treated, but also in, in all the bacteria sitting on the skin and in the intestine and everywhere on the animal. So it will simply increase the, the pool of antibiotic resistant bacteria. Many of these uh, resistance mechanisms, they can be transferred to other uh, bacteria. Uh, and in, in that way, indirectly uh, reach uh, humans and, and have in fact, uh, impact on, on uh, human health. Okay, so, so when you say about uh, selection of uh, resistant bacteria, uh, to be a little more specific, it's about survival of the bacteria which are able to go against the antibiotic action and continue to survive. Uh, taking this uh, forward, uh, Amit, I, I have a question for you. If you could, you know, uh, elaborate on this, on, on what do you understand or what uh, or tell our viewers about critically important antibiotics in the context of public health? You know, uh, we understand they are important mm -hmm. for human health and uh, why should they be preserved in, in, in AMR containment efforts? Uh so that's a very pertinent question, Rajeshri. First of all, thank you very much for having me on board. Uh, and uh, thank you, Carl, for also joining us and, and giving a very apt, uh, uh, I mean, starting the conversation with very apt point here uh, about, about uh, resist how resistance in animals can move to, to, the, to the human. So uh, I think what, uh, to answer your question in particular, uh, Rajeshri, it is important for us to actually understand as Carl also very rightly mentioned that it's the antibiotic use that leads to the resistance. So actually antibiotics have a, have a limited shelf. The more we use, they exhaust early. And in that sense, they are, they are a public good. They are a public resource and that needs to be preserved uh, so that uh, for a longer duration, the, the, the mankind can benefit, can get benefited by the antibiotics. Now, uh, the concept of critically important antibiotics came came about many years ago. Started from uh, it came up came up from WHO, and the overall aim was to preserve these antibiotics for human health use. And of course, as we move on, as the idea, as the understanding on the animal part of the issue also has come up, uh, the overall aim now has become to optimize their use in in, in not only human but also veterinary veterinary use. And this, this is actually a list which keeps on evolving uh, uh, over, over several years. There are several uh, iterations that have already happened based on new science and new research. There is this criteria which is followed uh, to kind of classify a particular antibiotic into a critical antibiotic or let's say uh, just an important antibiotic. So, and that criteria typically, for example, involves uh, whether that antibiotic is a sole therapy or a last resort therapy for a particular infection. Another set of criteria could be about whether that antibiotic is used for treating an infection which actually comes from animals. So, so keeping these criteria in mind, uh, the, there is a list and that list basically uh, enumerates classes of antimicrobials. And some of those classes, uh, as we all know, are also used in humans. Uh, uh, very, very, uh, I would say, uh, they have a very important use there such as quinolones, for example. We all know fluoroquinolones are very important for, for, several, for treating several kinds of infections. Then we have third and fourth generation cephalosporins. Uh, polymyxins is also one very important uh, 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 class of antibiotic and, and colistin, which is a polymyxin, is, is a last resort antibiotic uh, in the hospitals as we all know. And this list of antibiotic, critically important antibiotics is further classified into highest priority and high priority. Again, it follows some set of prioritization. So, so all in all, what we have today is a very clearly outlined list of antibiotics which should be preserved for human use, which uh, based on a certain criteria. 
And, and, and what, is, what is important is that as part of the global strategy, limiting use of critically important antibiotics is, is a very important part to contain AMR or to preserve antimicrobials overall for the human health, for the mankind. Uh, and, and, and the good part is this can be best preserved if, if the misuse and the overuse uh, is well contained. And as we know, as the research says, that it's the, it's the, it's the animal sector which uses quite a lot of antibiotics uh, therefore, the scope of such reduction is more there. Uh, so, so that is why this entire uh, point on uh, on using judicious use of critically important antibodies in the animal sector becomes a concern. Right. Uh, thanks, thanks, Amit, for letting us know. Uh, I would like to understand, uh, considering that, uh, like you said, that you know these these are a public good uh, meant for human health. A uh, couple of these that need to be preserved. Uh, Carl, if I may ask you, you know, Sweden has been uh, at the forefront of, of setting examples on how to handle the issue of uh, antibiotic misuse in food animals. Uh, if you could briefly take us through the historical steps, uh, as well as the current initiatives that, that uh, Sweden has taken and, and that has helped Sweden. And uh, what are the key uh, messages or learnings that, that developing countries or, or other countries uh, can have? from uh, your experiences? Yeah, <clears throat> I can do that. There's a lot of, of factors involved here, but uh, the, the, I think the a key element is simply to keep the animals uh, healthy. Uh, as you also know, Sweden was the first country to ban the antimicrobial growth promoters that happened back in the 1980s. Um, and there's a, we have, a set of good practices here for animal husbandry. Um, keep the animal healthy. Um, and that means uh, good hygiene and good management uh, practices by security uh, issues uh, in order not to introduce uh, infectious diseases. Um, you can have vaccination programs instead of treating with antibiotics uh, certain diseases, it's possible to, to vaccinate so they don't get the diseases. So uh, antimicrobial treatment is simply not necessary. Um, we also have a, a set of treatment guidelines, treatment recommendations, so to speak, for, um, which are specified for each animal species uh, with a list of diseases if you have this disease and this disease and this disease in your animals, you, the most appropriate uh, compound to treat with is this and this and this. And, and of course, we, we need to be sure that um, we, we are recommending first the, the use of a very narrow spectrum uh, antibiotics because they are less selective for antimicrobial resistant uh, bacteria than, um, than the more broad spectrum uh, uh, antibiotics. Another important issue is uh, proper diagnostics that you simply need to make sure that that you have you make the right diagnosis so so you are actually treating the right disease because uh, diarrhea can have many causes and before you uh, treat uh, the diarrhea you'll need to know which bacterium is that you are going to treat and the same with lung infections and so on uh, in, in animals. So these uh, this access to, to good diagnostic uh, services uh, is also uh, paramount uh, uh, for uh, lowering your, uh, your antimicrobial use and, and uh, have a proper and uh, a prudent use of, of antibiotics. And of course, um, a major issue is, is also what Dr. Kohana uh, mentioned before, that uh, there are specific antimicrobials that should be restricted for human use and should not be used for uh, treatment of animals, except in, in, in specific uh, particular occasions where nothing else works. That is, for example, the fluoroquinolones uh, or the uh, third and fourth uh, generation cephalosporines, colistein, um, and certainly the carbapenems, uh, which I think should never in any cases be used uh, for, for animal treatment. Okay, so so what I gather, uh, Carl, is that it's it's a it's a mixed bag of approaches that that is working in Sweden to you know bring down this misuse, and of course, uh, 
uh, understanding that one size does not fit all, I would uh, direct my uh, my question to Amit as well. Uh, what has been your experience, Amit? Uh, uh, where are we in terms of uh, uh, being able to uh, bring down or limit or make any effort to uh, curtail antibiotic misuse in animals? Uh, so thank you, Rajeshwari. Uh, first of all, I think uh, to be able to know uh, uh, what we want to reduce, how much we want to reduce, we first need to know how much it is being used. So, uh, and in as you know, in most most uh, developing countries also, uh, and India is also part of that, the understanding on how much of antibiotic uh, is used in the animal sector, particularly the food animal sector, is 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 not uh, uh, satisfactory. So in India also, we do not know how much of antibiotic is used in animals and how much humans. And it's something which can be done uh, 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 to some to, uh, to a certain extent uh, very easy, right? Uh, now, this is unlike uh, some of the Western countries, or let's say the, the European countries also, who have a, who have been publishing reports about antibiotic use. Uh, uh, in, in, in their countries. So I think there's clearly a lot that we have to learn from, from the best practices and how it is done uh, in this regard. Now, coming to the, to the, to the issue of uh, the extent of antibiotic uh, misuse, I mean, we know from the ground based on the studies and that we have conducted and the interaction that we have with, with several stakeholders, clearly misuse is a common practice. Uh, and this is not limited to one sector. I mean, this is also in poultry, this, hap this is happening in dairy sector, and this is also happening in aquaculture sector. And I again would like to say that uh, the situation in India is also again similar to many developing countries as we, as we also work in some countries in Africa. So antibiotic is, is used, uh, I would say, the, the, uh, across uh, different sectors uh, in, a, in, a, in a way which, which cannot be categorized as a judicious use or an optimal use. Uh, and this use in India also, as in many countries, it's about growth promotion and it's about mass disease prevention. And as we all know, uh, uh, the growth promotion use is about feed, antibiotics through feed largely, and that happens largely in the poultry sector, let's say. Uh, the issue of mass disease prevention is about, uh, is about uh, preventing, I mean, uh, mass medication, may, even in the absence of clinical sign, in the absence of any sign. And this particular mass disease prevention approach is actually a routine use. And so as the use of growth promotion and this routine mass use is a big concern. And, and there is an overlap between the two. Uh, we do not know where the growth promotion effect of a particular antibiotic actually uh, stops or where it, or from where the, the preventative aspect of a particular antibiotic, even if it is given through feed starts. So. So this overlap is also a concern. And in some sense, this overlap becomes a reason for, for many stakeholders to actually say, uh, if the growth promoter use is not going to end, uh, is lead, if it would lead to an uh, to increase in mass preventative use, then perhaps uh, mass and perhaps growth promoter use should not be, uh, need not be only addressed. And therefore, uh, both of those should be addressed uh, in totality uh, together. And that is something which poses a very significant challenge. But having said that, uh, all this is, is under the backdrop of the fact that there are the antibiotics for animal use is easily available. Uh, there are issues about inappropriate, inappropriate doses. There are issues about uh, lack of awareness in particular. Uh, there are issues about awareness, not only lack of awareness, not only in the farmers uh, or the producers, but also among the, 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 the scientific community and the veterinarians or the extension workers who reach out to, to these, these folks and are supposed to tell them what is the right way of doing a particular thing or what is not the right way. Uh, but, but, and on the policy side, I can tell you in our country right now, there is some progress, but a lot could have been done, uh, in my opinion, even after it's like year four of the NAP implementation that uh, we, we still have one good example, which is colistin, which now is banned uh, to be used in our country. But, but, there are, uh, but, there, but there are quite a lot of other critically important antimicrobials which are need to be regulated. Feed also needs to be regulated. Uh, amongst all this, there are some good initiatives also. 
we know that in the dairy sector, some of the dairy federations are, are, are actually coming up, uh, figuring out the, the importance and the use of ethno-veterinary medicine and, and other preventative aspects to minimize the control of, uh, minimize antibiotic use in mastitis. So that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good sign in one sector that we see. Uh, we also know in aquaculture, there is, there, is a, there is an initiative on registration of all inputs that are, that are used in the aquaculture. Uh, so if an antibiotic is there, it would get registered, it would be, in, it would be listed as part of the ingredient. There is also a residue monitoring plan uh, for the aquaculture, for some part of the aquaculture in India. Uh, but what is important here is that uh, uh, we still need to cover a lot of ground. We still need to get the, get the policy and the regulations set uh, right. We still need to create a lot of awareness among all stakeholders. Uh, we still we still need to to see really what is best happening in different parts of the world, and of course adapt to the local settings. Uh, so that that's where we we are as of now. Yeah, uh, very nicely articulated, Amit. But uh, Carl, do you have anything to say uh, on on what Amit uh, just mentioned? I mean, uh, what could be those uh, few key learnings that uh, that we should. Uh, start picking up or start uh, considering. You have some thoughts around this? Uh, <clears throat> I would say one of the major issues is to have a good surveillance program, that, which uh, was also mentioned that in, in Sweden, for example, we have this uh, um, surveillance program for both antimicrobial resistance in humans and in animals and um, a surveillance program for, for usage of, uh, or sales rather, um, of antimicrobials. We think all that is sold is also used, so sales and use is not really so much different, but at least it's the sales of antibiotics um, because it, that is the mean to, to con continuously follow what are the problems, which compounds are we selling too much of, and, and uh, what can be done to, to reduce that, and, and which bacteria do we see a high level of resistance in, and what, how should we then adapt uh, the um, treatment recommendations to, uh, to accommodate uh, that. I think that, that was one of the and, and I believe uh, uh, And I believe that this, uh, in the long run, this goes a, lo uh, this goes a long way in, in informing policy and decision-making as well. Uh, I will pick up one point which Amit uh, mentioned. He was mentioning about this uh, overlap issue, uh, that there is a very thin line of difference between the, uh, the idea of using antibiotics for growth promotion and, and disease prevention. We do not know where one ends and one begins. Uh, so so often, often this overlap uh, is a concern. But we also understand that there, uh, the lessons from developed part of the world who are trying to address this issue is that, you know, both can be addressed together. Uh, based, uh, and Europe is also already on its way to uh, banning uh, the uh, mass uh, preventative uh, use of antibiotics uh, starting 2022. So what do you think, Carl? What is it? Uh, they need to be addressed separately. Uh, these can be addressed together. Uh, what are your thoughts around this? Uh, what has been your experience? Yeah, well, that's my personal uh, opinion. In, in, but in my view, it's uh, the growth motors and the group medication are two different things or, or should be two different things because the antimicrobial growth motors are used uh, to feed uh, systematically uh, over an extended period of, of time to all animals, whether they are deceased or, or, or healthy. Uh, with, and it's not with the purpose specifically to treat a specific uh, disease or prevent a specific disease, but simply to make them grow faster. And it also suppresses a number of bacteria that can cause disease, such as Clostridia and others. Uh, that is one thing. Uh, and um, yeah, as I said earlier, Sweden was the, con the first country to, to ban the antimicrobial uh, growth motors. And basically, I don't think they have uh, any place in, in animal production and, and should be banned. Um, the, uh, the group medication uh, can be interpreted in, in different ways. Uh, I would say in, in some cases, it's justified uh, to use group medication. For example, a, a flock of poultry, you have 40,000 
uh, broiler chickens in a, in a flock and you cannot treat them individually. So the only solution here is to use uh, group medication, either via the feed or via uh, the drinking water. It can, can be both. So the, the, philosoph the, the philosophy behind uh, group medication um, is that you, there are animals that are diseased um, and you assume that when some of the animals in the flock or in a group are diseased, then the others are also infected. So within a few days, they will also get uh, sick and, and begin to have symptoms. So it's better to treat all of them uh, right away because if you only treat those that are sick now, then you'll just have to treat others uh, that get sick uh, tomorrow or the day after, after tomorrow. So if you interpret it in that way, um, I think it can also be justified to use uh, flock medication. And in many countries, flock medication is the preferred uh, treatment uh, for many animal species, but certainly poultry, but also for pigs. Um, but of course, it, it, uh, it can be exaggerated. So it, it becomes, and I know that is the case in some countries, that it becomes uh, more or less a, a routine prophylactic uh, treatment to prevent the animals from getting sick. Um, and, and if that is done, then I think it's, it's other measures that, that are needed uh, simply to prevent the, the uh, animals uh, from get, getting sick. Um, and if that it, it ends up in a more or less routine use of uh, prophylactic, mesophylactic group medication, then of course you also get the antimicrobial growth mode effect because then, then it essentially works as a, as a, a growth uh, promoter. The reason why we don't like uh, group medication so much is that uh, if you treat an, an, an animal individually, it will usually be via an um, injection. It can also be orally, but in many cases it's uh, by injection. So you, you, you make an, an impact of only a, a few bacteria or a, a limited number of bacteria. Whereas if you use a group medication, it's via the feed or, or drinking water, then you have an effect not just on, on the bacteria that causes the infection that you want to treat, but for all other bacteria present in the intestinal tract. So it will simply boost the, the pool of antimicrobial resistant bacteria in, 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 um, in, in the intestine. So that's why we advocate that um, as far as possible, individual treatment uh, is recommended. And that is actually the case here in Sweden. Uh, I think also that's one of the important lessons to, to learn from Sweden that the, the majority of the treatments are actually individual treatments. Right. Um, any, any quick thoughts, Amit, you have uh, take in continuation from what uh, Carl just, just finished about uh, preferring individual treatments uh, over uh, group treatments? Yeah, yeah, of course. I think uh, clearly, uh, I mean, the message that I get right now from Carl is that um, uh, group medication is, is perhaps uh, um, even more big of a problem. And that needs to be that needs to be addressed. And the moment a medication becomes a group medication, it is in many ways similar to the growth promotion promoter use because that is also given to a lot of numbers into the masses. Now, now, now the but of course, as we know, uh, in India, we are still struggling to figure out the growth promotion promoter uh, issue. As, as, as we know, feed is still largely unregulated. And uh, despite many years of discussions, we still do not have uh, uh, a concrete uh, regulation in India which tells so-and-so antibiotics is not allowed. And this is despite the fact that we all know that we have some examples from, from countries across the world who banned growth promoters in feed like about two, like two and a half decades ago. So that clearly is a challenge. And I, I'm, I'm very, I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I, I kind of wonder when we will actually now move to the, to the other part of the problem, which is disease prevention. We are yet not able to solve the issue of growth promotion, growth promoters. So, so it's a big challenge. And uh, I'm not really undermining the challenge that we have in India. Clearly the situation is different. Uh, our solutions also have to be different. But, but the worry, of course, the concern that I have is that uh, it's been many years now we are into this, this, this accelerated momentum of national action plan, global action plan, plan on, on containing AMR. 
uh, but but I, I I'm not really happy about the way we are moving because for example we do not have sat together so far and figured out okay the animal side of folks telling this and this antibiotic is very important for us and the human side of folks sitting out and figuring out together make developing a consensus okay you have this set of this set of antibiotics removed from your list and we have this set of a set of antibiotics kind of. Uh, 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 put more emphasis upon. And what I'm trying to say is that the consensus has not really happened so far. And that is a big worry. I, I do not know if we have ever sat across the table to actually solve this crisis. So, so uh, that is a big worry. And, uh, and of course, the other worry is that uh, uh, the standard treatment guidelines, which Carl mentioned, which are there in Sweden, we do not have those. Uh, and it's, it's very similar to the standard treatment guidelines that we have in the human health sector that guide all the, the community as well as clinicians, community practitioners, as well as those in the hospitals, actually. Uh, I do not see such, such standard operating procedures or standard treatment guidelines for, for veterinarians in our country. So a lot of work on, the, on, the, on that side and the extension side, where the veterinarians themselves, if they know, they kind of translate and transfer that information and uh, to the farmers. That is a big gap and that is a big worry. So I really wonder when we would really approach to, the, to, to a situation where just like Europe is planning by 2022 to kind of uh, eliminate the, the, the group preventative use, I wonder when we would, we would be able to do that, but we will have to do it. It's, a, it's very critical for the, for the global health. It's very critical for the Indian public health. So uh, we have to sit down, sit together and start working, start acting on this issue and not really just talking in the meetings, just talking in the conferences, making plans, but not really executing those. So that's my worry. Right. Uh, but what is interesting here is, the, is, is that, that element of contrast that we see as, as both of you speak uh, from different parts uh, of the world. Uh, now let's talk about solutions. You know, Amit, Amit hinted a little bit on, on, on the use of you know, alternative approaches like, like ethnobet medicines. Uh, Carl, uh, at the very beginning, you talked about biosecurity, hygiene, uh, farm management, vaccination, and all of that. Uh, my, question, my question to you it is, is, of course, this is important. Uh, this is one of the key uh, ways to, to uh, not allow disease to come in at the very first place. But uh, this question is for both of you. How do you think is, you know, investing in all these kind of measures, bringing focus in all these kind of measures, particularly in the global south, where, uh, you know, antibiotics becomes a very easy substitute of, of hygiene or farm cleanliness. How important is investing in these kind of approaches and how feasible it is? Uh, Carl, uh, you can let us know. Well, in my view, it's paramount uh, to invest in these things. I am perfectly aware that uh, treatment with antibiotics, because antibiotics are so cheap, uh, is uh, economically more uh, feasible. Uh, but I think that there's simply no way around it that, that we have to install um, good management practices uh, and, and alternative me measures to um, to cope with antimic antimicrobial resistance. And that is, uh, as I mentioned, to have a good surveillance system, both on the, on the use of antibiotics and the resistance levels in uh, important bacteria, both those that you need to, to treat uh, uh, the diseases with, uh, in, in animals and the zoonotic uh, bacteria. Uh, the treatment guidelines, Make sure you have biosecurity. Biosecurity can be practiced in, in different ways, but I think it is important to, to prevent the diseases to, to get access to, to your animals. Uh, and that can be biosecurity measures, just like when you, when you purchase uh, new animals, make sure that they are tested for specific diseases so they don't, don't bring diseases to your farm and so on. Um, good diagnostic measures are also important. So as I said before that, so you're sure you're actually treating the disease that you think you're treating and, and not uh, another one. Um, <clears throat> feeding systems can also be a measure, for example, the composition of the, the feed in for pigs, for piglets around the weaning time, 
It can be uh, very important for the development of diarrhea that the, the feed has a specific composition, maybe lower percentage of, of uh, soy protein or something like that. Um, so it's, it simply gives us more smooth transition from uh, um, suckling uh, animal to non-suckling animal. It's a, it's a very dramatic change in the diet for, for small animals uh, and it has an impact, very severe and impact on the composition of the microbiota in the intestine. So if, um, if there are things you can do to make that transition more smooth, it will also help uh, in, in diarrhea. But certainly um, antimicrobial antibiotic stewardship, as Amit also mentioned, uh, the how to the experience from the academia, how can that be transferred to the practice in veterinarians and, and further out uh, to, to, the, to the farmer to do the right things? Uh, um, okay. That is also very important. Right. Uh, uh, Amit, you, I, I understand you have, uh, uh, you've worked in, you've engaged with Africa as well as part of your uh, campaign. Uh, so what do you think, uh, given your experiences, are we investing enough in these alternative methods or approaches and so that we do not allow the disease to come in the first place? Are we lagging behind? Uh, is there a way forward? Uh, where do we stand? Uh, I think we we have to kind of uh, and this is a, this is a common thing I see in in, in developed parts of the world uh, and perhaps also in other parts of the world. The f the problem actually is inherent to the uh, to the intensive way of producing food, which is which is chemical uh, intensive, which is which has high stocking densities. Uh, I mean, in the COVID times also, we have seen the importance of social distancing. I mean, then how do you expect uh, in, a, in, a, in a poultry farm, so many, many thousands of birds just, just, lay, just kind of uh, uh, put up very close by uh, in a very, uh, in a, uh, and then expect that uh, disease would not come. So, so it's, this, this, this is very, very tricky. For a, for a country like India, let's say, or for a, country, a developing country where the food security is a big issue, the, the nutrition security is a big, big issue, the importance of uh, uh, proteins from animals is, 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 a, is, a, is a very big issue. How do, you, how, do you, how do you create a balance where you do not really have uh, intensive food systems which do not are the breeding grounds of diseases? I mean, how do you manage that? You, you first have those systems, you have the diseases to prevent those diseases, you keep on pumping the antibiotics. Now, how do you manage that? So this is very tricky, very challenging. Nevertheless, nevertheless, there's a great role I see in biosecurity. There's a great importance I see in the animal husbandry practices. And therefore, uh, trying to identify what are those practices, uh, both in case of biosecurity and any, animal husbandry would not be, which are not as resource intensive, not as cost intensive, uh, that could that are suitable for 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 uh, for the local conditions is something that we need to work upon. We need to therefore have a have a, something like a national program which identifies these practices, invests in them, incentivize uh, uh, those who are practicing it, tell the farmers uh, that yes these these and make them aware. Do a lot of capacity building even within the veterinary community around it. I think that there I see a big hope because it this kind of preventative approach will help us use less chemicals. And in this case, this is actually the only sustainable way. There's no other sustainable way. Uh, we can, of course, use uh, the vaccines, of course, is another alternative. Uh, there are so, uh, so much drugs and alternatives which keep on coming. But do we have a very clear uh, research agenda set around those? Do we have a very good understanding on what is working in what setting and, and what kind? And it is not clearly led by the, by the commercial incentives or the commercial uh, enterprises. So we really have to figure out and, and therefore, I, I really see a lot of hope in, in the, in the, in the ethnovet practices that we are now seeing in the Indian dairy sector. That is in that you know in a very structured way is trying to address the problem. So that is very encouraging, uh, in my view. And we need to invest and we need to incentivize uh, these approaches in a much at a much larger, uh, I would say, pan India level. Okay. Uh, so so taking uh, taking. Uh 
uh, an example from what you said, uh, you know, we are we are in an LMIC setting. Uh, we have uh, small farmers, and the the idea that if antibiotics are not used when there is disease, uh, the the animal may die or the animal may collapse out of not receiving treatment, and then it can become a concern of food security going forward. So. What should be the roadmap, Carl? What do you think? Uh, any message you have? Uh, I understand settings are different, uh, situations are different, but uh, what do you have in mind? Uh, how can we go about this? And and um, if you can tell us uh, next, you know, what is it that we need to do differently? If you partly touched upon all of those, but briefly, uh, you can tell us what is it that LMICs need to do differently and and. Uh, and get over this uh, issue of that if we, if antibiotics are not used, the food security will become a concern. Carl? Yeah, that, that's a very difficult uh, question. Uh, um, but as I said before, th there's really no way around it to make it sustainable. We need to simply phase out the, or at least dramatically uh, decrease the use of an the antibiotics. Um, on a short or long term. I acknowledge perfectly that, especially in low and middle income countries, uh, that locally produced food is uh, paramount for the local economy, for food security, and also for uh, simply for employment uh, in, in, the, in the local communities. Uh, so of course that is important. Uh, and I don't know if you can imagine um, regulations or progress in, in different uh, countries at a different speed. Um, so, so countries where the food sec security is a, a more um, pronounced issue that uh, they can go forward at a slower speed with these. But, but the transition to using less antibiotics is there irrespective of, of where you are. Uh, simply to, to have a sustainable uh, production of, uh, of meat and milk and, and eggs. I don't see any, any shortcuts around that. Yes, uh, Amit? I completely agree with Carl. I mean, there are no shortcuts to it. Uh, it's a long journey, but that is why it worries me that a long journey uh, should start timely and we are already quite delayed. If we start long, uh, too late for a long journey, uh, I mean, I do not know when we would reach the logical conclusion. So, so therefore, it's important to actually start now. I mean, it, it's delayed, but nevertheless, it's, it's a good time to start now. Sit, sit, figure out in a very systematical way how we can address this issue. And in my mind, the most sustainable solution is focusing on preventative aspects. And that basically means focusing on biosecurity, focusing on animal husbandry, focusing on alternatives. That's one part of the issue. And the other part of this is, once since there are better ways of, of producing animal uh, food from animals, that needs to be told to, to the person who is actually producing that food. And I see a big role, therefore, of the awareness. And that means if, if farmers are to be told how to produce the food, each veterinarian of this country should know how, how to produce food sustainably. Each policymaker of this country should know how the food can be produced uh, sustainably. And that kind of knowledge transfer, that should happen in a very systematic, in a very planned way. So, so to me, awareness, uh, reaching out to the last, last person is very critical. Focus on biosecurity, uh, uh, animal husbandry, very critical. But very important uh, is also the importance of regulations in our country, because somehow, we, 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 uh, this is a different country in some sense where, uh, where you really need to have regulations to be kind of, uh, uh, to, to kind of, to begin with. That's the first step. And I'm, I'm very well aware that that's not the last step, but regulations still, still are the first step. So we will have to now figure out what antibiotics we want to allow to be used in the animal sector. And that should not be done haphazardly. That should be done based on consultations, based on, but th those consultations should not be, should not be, there should be a very clear intent of acting on those consultations. And that is what I, I think it's time, it's time for acting on AMR rather than just planning on AMR. We've done it. It's been many, many years now. 
five years, <clears throat> at least I know after the global action plan, we are, we are still struggling to figure out the basics of it. So in my view, it's time to act and, uh, and, and, and it's time to really move towards food systems which are much more sustainable, which are much more environmental friendly, which are much more friendly to the public health. So that's how, there are no shortcuts. I completely agree with Carl. So that's what my take on this is. Right, uh, but, but thank you also Amit for you know, summing up this entire conversation today in the last bit that you said. I think we, uh, we set out on understanding by the first question was what do you understand by misuse in animals? And from there we've talked about problems, we've talked about what is missing, what is there and what needs to be done. Uh, a lot of areas we've touched upon today, and I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that these issues have come up. Uh, different experiences have been talked about uh, from, uh, from, uh, from your uh, internal experiences of work. Uh, but, but the key takeaway message is, I think what Carl said and Amit agreed, is the, the transition to using less antibiotics should happen, you know, irrespective of where you are. And there are no shortcuts. There are no excuses. It uh, and and immediately what Amit said that the time is now to start uh, to start working on it. Uh, I think that's the broad message that should go, and everything should be customized around that. And and laws and enforcement both go hand in hand. And it's uh, it's 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 important that uh, as much laws, as much meetings, as much documentation, as much approaches are talked about. Uh, it is equally important that, that we process those and implement those and, and try and see what is working, where it is working, how much is working. Uh, just to close this, I, I would like to thank both of you, Carl uh, and Amit. Thank you for an interesting uh, piece of discussions. Uh, we've had limited questions, but we've touched on, on all aspects. It's been an interesting chat with both of you. And I really want to thank you on behalf of CSC and Yes, uh, the viewers who are watching us, uh, stakeholders who are watching us, I hope uh, you, you have some messages for you to take forward and you can reach out to us or Carl uh, to know more on this. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very thank you. much, Rajshree.